As Nick said, we're going to be looking, carrying on our journey in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, looking at chapter 11. Um, now, this chapter is all about this, about our meetings, really. Um, or it was about their meetings, but it's about worship and coming together and different things we will do in those times. Um, okay. Okay, so some of you may know this chapter, or it may ring a sort of, I don't know what it will say to you, the first part of this chapter, but it is traditionally been seen as a, as a chapter quite difficult, perhaps for ladies or women in the church, because of some of the things it says. I'm just going to briefly address those. That isn't really the focus of my message today, but I, I felt it was probably worth um, mentioning. Um, just, I'm not going to cover the whole thing, and there are parts of this first chapter, first half of this chapter, that I don't understand. People have written books on this. Scholars are still debating it, and um, there are some difficult things to, to understand quite what Paul is getting at. But just a few things. Uh, you may be familiar with verse 3. It says, Paul says, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband. And the head of Christ is God. And some people may have used that. Some men may have used that. Say, hey, wife, I'm your head. You know, you need to do what I say. Okay. I wanted to, and, and some women may have read that and thought Paul's being very sexist here. I don't think he is, personally, and I'll just briefly explain why. Um, head, the word head in Greek can have three meanings. It, the word is actually kephale in Greek, and it can mean your head, like this. It can mean head, to have uh, authority over someone, and it can also mean origin, so the origin, like the headwaters, yeah? The headwaters of a river, that's where the river flows from. I think, probably, Paul is using it in that sense here, so the origin of a wife is her husband. And what Paul, the, the, the Greek word, can it can be man. Wherever it says in this chapter wife or husband, it's the same word as man or woman. So the, it could be the origin of a woman is her husband. And what I think Paul's getting at here is how God made Eve out of Adam. He took the rib out of, Eve, uh, out of Adam and made Eve out of her. And he refers to that later on. Um, but it doesn't suggest any superiority because in the net, after it says the head of a wife is her husband, the head of Christ is God. So God, the Father, is not any way superior to God the Son, to Christ, just as he's not suggesting that the husband is superior to his wife. Okay, um, other bit in this uh, chapter that uh, again some people were oh this is outrageous you can't say this Paul um, he, he says in verse 8 for man was not made from woman but woman from man neither was man created for woman but woman for man and again people say oh women have just been made for men well again I think Paul's referring back to the creation story here and he was saying um, man Woman was made out of man um, originally and um, was created for man because man was lonely and wanted, it was said it wasn't good for him to be on his own. So woman was created to help, help the man uh, originally. Why is, Paul, Paul balances this just a few verses later. He says, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. So he's saying that, you know, yes, originally a uh, woman was taken out of man, made from man, but now men are born from women. We're all, you know, we're all equal. He's just showing different sides of things there. Okay, now, what I really want to get to in this, what this, I believe this chapter is about, or the, particularly the first half, 
is about something that was going on in the church in Corinth. And hopefully you've got a bit of a picture of this church in Corinth. There's a sea town. There would be big ships coming in. There'd be sailors in there. And, and there was, it was a sort of bustling market town by the sea. Okay. Now, the main, one of the main points Paul is trying to make in this is about women, and he's exhorting women to cover their heads. Now, he says, when women are prophesying or praying, okay? And he talks about men prophesying or praying in the church. Now, first of all, this is another point, just to... Uh, Get across to you, I don't, you know, Paul is not anti-women or anti-women in, in leadership or, or in ministry. Um, he could have just dealt with this problem by saying, well, women shouldn't prophesy or pray in the church. You know, that would be a simple solution to this problem. But because the problem was that there were women in the church sort of probably maybe coming up to the front or in a gathering like this, praying and prophesying publicly with their heads uncovered. Okay, now what was going on? What's the whole deal about the heads being uh, covered? In those days, if a lady had her hair cut very, very short or shaved and, and didn't have her head covered, she would generally, in this, in this culture, be seen, she'd probably be a prostitute. Okay, that's how ladies would have, uh, they would have been showing themselves off by, not having, by having their hair short, not having it covered. And Paul was saying, look, I don't want you ladies... So some of the ladies, I think, in the church have, have come into their newfound freedom in Christ. They've maybe heard Paul's message in Galatians, it's for freedom you have been set free. And they thought, hey, I don't need to bother with these cultural um, customs, you know, people, women having to cover their heads. I'm free. I'm a free woman. You know, I can do what I like now. And, and Paul's saying, well, yes, but you need to be careful with your freedoms. And actually, that's a, something that he, he continues to say throughout this letter. Yes, you are free. Um, but as, as it says earlier on, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Or in some translations, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial or constructive. So what he's saying really in this first part is to the ladies, look, I know you're free, you're free in Christ, but people aren't going to respect you. You're going to bring the church into disrepute or ridicule. Um, people are going to think you're, you know, you're a wanton woman, you're a prostitute. Um, just, just put your head covering on. And he's saying, actually, in this case, you do need to take note of the culture around you and, and think about the, the context. Through this chapter, there's a theme going on about them living in uh, Corinth. And you could say through the whole book, actually. What what do they, you know, they are in, Jesus said you're in, sorry, it's in, no, Jesus didn't say, but it's in the New Testament. You are in the world, but not of the world. Maybe Jesus did say that. I can't remember, but it's in the New Testament. You're in the world. You've probably heard that, but you are not of the world. And Paul in this letter is, is really kind of helping people to, there's, there's different things they've got to wrestle with. So what of the world do you need to kind of, come away from and be different from and and what parts do you need to respect he says well in this case just put a head covering on ladies it's a really simple answer to to this problem and you will be respected i want you to be respected in the church i want your prayers and your prophecies to be respected okay now coming on to the second half of the chapter It's about the Lord's Supper. So again, it's to the, to the people gathered in the church. And again, he's addressing a cultural, uh, a cultural um, situation in Corinth. It seems, I'm going, to read, I'm going to read a bit of this. So this is from verse 17. Those of you who've got your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognised. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, 
Each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So what was going on here? In the church in this time, what would often be happening is the church would gather together and have a meal together. Okay? They'd bring their own food. Uh, Much as we have done in the past, I'm sure we'll be getting back to doing so. Uh, Those of you who are new, we'd have a table along that side and people would just all bring their different food. And once a month, we'd sit in here and and eat eat together, share fellowship and and, uh, break bread together. Okay, so that is what, what would have happened in Corinth. But it seems that the wealthy, so in those days, people who are wealthy would have had, you know, massive meals, quite an excess of food at their house. They maybe have a five course meal and and lots of food and their servants wouldn't eat with them uh, and they probably wouldn't even get the leftovers. They might get the scraps if they were lucky. So you had this uh, different echelons of society. Now, what Paul's saying is this is happening coming into church. So those wealthier people, they bring their nice hampers and they lay them out and they have their fine wine on the table. And those who are poor would be having their leftover sandwiches from last week and scraps of bread. And they weren't sharing together. And Paul said, this isn't OK. You can't do this. So this is, a, this is what's going on in society. And he's saying, no, don't bring this into church. I want you should you are all equal here and you should be sharing together. So he goes on to say, because what they would have done is eaten like that. And then at some point they would have broken bread and passed a cup around and shared what we call communion together. Or some people call it the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, remembering Christ as he as Jesus um, instituted at the, um, the night before he was betrayed yeah, in the upper room told us, do this in remembrance of me. So they would have done that sort of as part of their meal. But Paul's saying, you're not, this isn't a Lord's Supper. You're not being, you can't sit in here and have all the wealthy people having their food and the poor sitting separately. Bring it a little bit more in our day and age. In churches in England, you would have had, say, 100 years ago, you might have very, the very nice pews at the front for the wealthy and then the one, the poor people would have been standing at the back. God was equally horrified at that. So this is a warning um, not to be doing this. And he says, well, you, you, you're disrespecting the body of Christ. He talks about the, the, the body. And that could refer to Jesus's body and it could refer to the body of Christ. People, people don't know. Um, But he says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body and drink, uh, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Okay, how can we apply all this to our church here, our time here. Okay. In terms of the face, the head coverings, you know, we're, we're still wearing our face masks, aren't we? And some of us might be like, oh, come on, I've had enough of, I've had enough of face masks, we don't want to wear them. But, but this is what our leaders have decided we're doing for the moment. So it's great. We, we, can't, we want to come with a good heart and, and, uh, and wear a face covering. If, if you think what... Paul was talking to those people about in terms of their dress is completely irrelevant to us. I just like you to have a, have a little think that you do or think about what you wear when you come to church. And if someone turned up in a bikini, that might be a bit, a little bit strange. Yeah. So we do have customs in our culture. If you were going to the, you were invited to Buckingham Palace for a tea party with the queen would you turn up in your bathing suit probably not if you wore your bathing suit on the beach would that be okay yes okay so so there is we can translate it to and there is an appropriateness um, that you can have in church now regarding the lord's table and the lord's supper sharing communion together i was thinking about how we have our fellowship together 
And I think we're a wonderful church, a very diverse church, people from all different backgrounds. And I love the way we all bring our food and we all put it together on the table and everyone can share. Um, I think we do that very nicely. I think probably personally, I, I could make sure everyone else has what they want. And, you know, I don't dive in too much myself. Probably that's, that's one thing for me. It might be a few others, you know, we, just, we, can, we can be courteous to each other. But generally, I think we have a nice fellowship. We're going to take communion in a minute and uh, we're just going to share, share the bread and the wine. And as we're doing that, I just want to, us to think about what it means. I'm going to read verses which I, I've just skipped over there but as, we, as we take communion. Um, and I just want us to come into a place of reverence. We may not be doing quite what the Corinthians are doing, but let's just understand that is what Paul's talking about. That's what they were doing. But he's also exhorting all of us as we come to the place of taking communion. I personally think we could be doing that quite often. Um, I think the early church was doing it probably every week, possibly every day, um, taking the bread and the wine to remember, to remember Christ, to remember what he's done for us. Okay. Um, can I just ask for a few, two or three people to just volunteer to come up and hand out the Tony one? Thank you. Just two or three others. Just come out and hand these. Okay. And we're going to have a, Ros is going to sing a song for us, lead, lead us in a song which you can join in with. But I just want us to be quiet for a minute. I'm going to. It wants to be quiet as we think as we, we think about what the bread and the this in this case the grape juice signifies. Now Paul says in this letter, but I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. He's talking about tradition that he's, he's received. He's passing it on. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we'll just take a bit of time. Thank you, Tony. Do this between yourselves or just have a bit of time just to think on the new covenant of his blood, what he did for us on the cross, shedding his blood, pain, the physical pain, the separation from God on the cross, separation from the Father and the Spirit on the cross that Jesus went through. everything he did so that we could be free, so that we could, we could be free, free to exercise our freedom as God directs us.